I ended up in San Diego, California, and was there I got heavily involved in um, crack cocaine. At the time, they called it freebasing. By the time I left California, I had a full-fledged addiction to crack cocaine. And so I had to find ways and means to get more drugs. So um, I went on the streets in my hometown and became a street prostitute. I put the laundry down and I walked over to the radio and I began to just pour my heart out to God. I began to tell him that I was sorry. And I began to ask him to forgive me. But I knew when I finished pouring my heart out to God that day that my past life was over. I was born in the Bronx, um, lived in Brooklyn, up until I was about four years old when my mother died. Um, Then we moved to North Carolina. My sisters and I moved to North Carolina, and we were raised by... Uh, my grandmother. And my grandmother was a God-fearing woman. And so that's how I learned about God and who Jesus was, was through my grandmother. And I lived with her for about five years until she passed away. And then I lived with an aunt for about five years. It was while I was living with my aunt that, you know, I started going to church and being in Sunday school and being around other kids and, you know, in the church environment, sang on the choir and just led led a normal childhood. So when I moved in with my aunt, she had her own children, and um, I was being molested um, by one of her children. And I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want to um, be separated from my sisters. I felt like that would be, that would cause a problem. So I just kept this secret for a lot of years. You know, by the time I was 14, I started dating and um, right away I became sexually active at the age of 14. And it wasn't long before then I became uh promiscuous, you know, started seeing other people. So I didn't have, um, I had a Christian upbringing, but I didn't, other than my grandmother, I didn't have a lot of um, Christian um, examples before me. Um, We were brought up in a Christian home, but I saw people doing things that were not godly. By the time I was um, 16, I was smoking marijuana. I was using, you know, gateway drugs. And um, then I went on to uh, other drugs. And by the time I graduated from high school, which was probably by the skin of my teeth, uh, I, I barely graduated. But I did graduate in 1976 from high school. So the plan from there was to join the Navy, (laughs) go see the world. And and that's what I did. I joined the Navy and traveled. And I stayed in the Navy for six years. And then after I got out of the Navy, I um, decided to embark on a modeling career, which I wasn't very successful in that because I didn't have the financial backing. So I I did a lot of traveling at the time. I moved around quite a bit, and I ended up in San Diego, California. And was there I got heavily involved in um, crack cocaine. At the time, they called it freebasing. And I stayed in California for about a year to a year and a half. And by the time I left California, I had a full-fledged addiction to crack cocaine. I had nowhere to live. We were homeless. We, uh, My roommate and I, we just were not doing well. So anyway, I decided to come back to the um, East Coast. I had a child while I was in the Navy. Then I had another child out of wedlock. And so my life was really starting to kind of like deteriorate right before my very eyes. But I kept making geographical relocations, thinking that if I could just get to this particular place, things would be better. 
But everywhere I went, I showed up. So the problem was not in uh, the places. The problem was in me. But it would take me many years before I would realize that. And um, finally, I, I ended up in Florida. When I went to Florida, I just just sunk to an all-time low. And it was while there in Florida, I met a very abusive man, and uh, I had a child by him. And um, I began um, turning tricks on the street. I began prostituting for um, cocaine. And I lived this way for about four years while I was in Florida. Wow. And then I came, I left Florida on probation. Uh, I had a judge that just literally sent me home. He said, if I let you go home, you promise not to come back to Florida. And I did. So he released me from jail. I got my baby and came back home. So I thought, again, another, if I can just get home, things will be better. And it wasn't because I had a full crack addiction. And uh, even though my hometown was slow. They didn't know anything about this. At least my family didn't. I still had this habit. And so I had to find make ways and means to get more drugs. So uh, I went on the streets here. I, I went on the streets in my hometown and became a street prostitute. And uh, I lived this way for many years. I was just in and out of jail, in and out of prison. And I continued uh, living this way until 1994. I was in jail in 1994, had been in jail many other times before. And um, something about jail, I always said the sinner's prayer, you know, said I wanted to be saved. But that was always short-lived. Whenever I get out, I went back to my old way. But this time in 1994, something really phenomenal took place in my life. I met the Lord Jesus in jail, and uh, it was the last place I expected him to be, but he he was there. Um, I was um, asked to work that day in the laundry room in the basement of the jail. And so at first I, I said I would, and then I, I changed my mind, but then this officer she came back to get me, and she said, I, I, I thought you said you were going to work for me. And so I reluctantly, you know, got dressed and went to work for her. And she promised um, us, there were six women working in that laundry room. She promised each of us that we would, um, we could listen to the radio station of our choice for one hour. So this one girl, she went first, and I had to listen to country and western for a whole hour. And then my time came, I was second, I said, Put it on the gospel station. I wanted to hear the local Christian radio station, and uh, and, and, and they and Janet, where, where did that came from? Like that desire was this? You you hadn't met Jesus yet. No, right? I hadn't met Jesus. But there's something about going to jail and trying to get acquainted with Jesus. And so this was, um, but I don't know really. This was unusual because I had never done this before. This was completely all God. Yeah. I, I was just following along. So what happened was I was there in the laundry room, and I told them, um, I want to hear the gospel station. Put it on the gospel station. And um, the first song that came on the radio was a song um, by the Dallas-Fort Worth Mass Choir called Another Chance. And I had never heard this song before, but this song was the epitome of what, was on my heart. And the words to this song said, I'm sorry, forgive me, clean me up, and give me another chance. And that song literally broke me. And I just began to weep. I just felt like they're singing my song. I put the laundry down, and I walked over to the radio, and I began to just pour my heart out to God. I began to tell him that I was sorry. And I began to um, ask him to forgive me and not to let me die and go to hell because this particular time was different from any other time I had been to jail. I was at the point, I knew I was at the point of death. Uh, I was so emaciated and malnourished that when I got to jail, 
at 8 o'clock at night, I asked for a tray of food. And the officer in charge who was booking me, she took one look at me, and she knew I was in bad shape. And she said, Janet, if you just let me finish booking you, I'll bring you a tray of food. And she did. So this was different. This was not like the other times I had been to jail. Little did I know was that God had a plan for my life this time, and this was going to be it. I do believe this was going to be it. I began to cry out to God, and I asked him to save me. I, I, I had this conversation with him. I said, I know my grandmother prayed to you, and she talked to you, and that was real, but I don't know if you're real. So I asked the Lord to reveal himself to me. Just save me. Just give me another chance and save me. And um, he did. He did right there on the spot. I knew that I was never, ever going to be a crack addict again. I was never going to be a street prostitute again. I knew that I was never going to live the life that I had lived prior to this. I knew I was never going to live that life again. Now, I didn't know where I was going to live. I didn't have an address. I was homeless. And I didn't even know where my next meal was coming from. But I knew something had changed in my life that day. You know, there was no preacher there. There was no minister to lead me through the sinner's prayer. There was no—it was just me and God and a song on the radio. And I wept profusely. I wept so much that an officer came from upstairs down in the basement, and he said, what is all this racket going on? And the other women that I was in the laundry room working with, they said, leave her alone. She's just talking to God. Wow. And he turned around, and he went back upstairs, and he just let me finish having my conversation with God. But I knew when I finished pouring my heart out to God that day— that my past life was over. I knew it. You know, I didn't have to shout it. I didn't have to say. I just knew within me that that was the end of that life. And so uh, the girls that were in the laundry room, they knew something had happened, so they bet against me. (laughs) They said, we give her two weeks and she'll be back on crack. And then somebody said, we give her two weeks and she'll be back prostituting. Wow. And someone else said, we give her two weeks and she'll be back in jail. But God has kept me for 30 long years. Wow. And I have to give him all of the praise and all of the glory. So that's how I came to know the Lord Jesus. He made a house call. He met me in the Forsyth County Jail. Now, Janet, I, I want to I wanna slow it down here. When, when you called out to God and you were asking for forgiveness, can you share with us a little bit more of what was going through your mind and what that conversation was like, even from his end to you? Well, um, I can tell you what I said to him. He never said anything. He never said anything. There was a knowing from him to me. But what I said to him was, I said, I am sorry for the way that I have lived. And I said, I'm sorry for the way that I've almost completely destroyed my life. And I told him, I know you didn't create me to live like this because I know that that life is a gift and um, it's supposed to, I use this word, glorify you, even though I didn't know where it came from. But I knew that I was not living a life that was pleasing to him. And so I asked him to forgive me for that. And then, as I said, I was certain that I was dying. And I knew enough about the Lord from my upbringing in Sunday school. I knew that if I died without Jesus, that it would be terrible, that hell was going to be my home. So I didn't, I didn't want that. And so I asked him, please don't let me die and go to hell. And he, he never said, or I, I don't recall hearing him say anything, there was a knowing that when I got through pouring my heart out to him, 
that it was finished. Wow. Janet, at this time, when you were in, in jail, prison, how long was that time? Um, I don't even remember. I, I want to say maybe about a month. Okay. You know, um, maybe I had been there two to three weeks to a month. Okay, so now you, people are betting against you, and you're going to be back exactly where you left off. This is probably just a phase, just a moment. Everybody has these in jail. No big deal. What happened after that? Well, um, I got released. I went to court on my court date, and the judge said to me, he said, Miss Lady, he said, you've done a wonderful job at ruining your life. And he said, go on out there and finish the job. Wow. And that kind of struck me. I was like, wow. I, I couldn't believe a judge would say that. So something in me had to prove him wrong. I wasn't going to go out there and finish the job. I know what had happened to me in the basement of the Forsyth County Jail. So he didn't know, but that part of my life was over. So when I got released, things just began to happen. Uh, a lady said I could come and stay with her, a Christian lady. She said, tell Jan she can come and stay with me. So that was a door that God opened because other than that, I don't know where I would have gone. God began to move. Instead of me getting sent back to prison, I got three probations at one time. And, you know, I had to pay fees in each one of them. But I knew that was God opening. He, he was making a way for me. A lady stood up in court for me, and she spoke on my behalf. Someone who normally would have never done that. So God was moving. I saw his hand moving. He didn't say that I wouldn't go back to prison. He never promised me that. What he told me while I was in the holding cell was to tell the truth. That's what he said. He said, Jan, trust me and tell the truth. So I did. I told the truth because everybody says not guilty. So I had said it many times before, but this time I heard him say, Jan, tell the truth. Trust me. So I told the truth. And the judge released me. Wow. So I could see the hand of God moving in the courtroom, and I got released within a few hours. So, I mean, everything was just working in my favor. I have a place to stay now. I have a choice. I can either go and stay with this Christian lady, or I can go back to the streets. I chose to go and stay with this Christian lady. I had a probation officer. I could do what he told me to do, make sure I didn't have any dirty urines, urines or I could um, use drugs again and end up in prison. So I chose, because I had made a vow to God, and this is what I said to God when I was in the basement of the, the laundry room, I said to him, if you will save me, I will serve you till I die. Those were the last words I said to God. And so I had made a vow. I made a vow that I had never made before. You know, before I got in the, the, the circle and said the sinner's prayer, but I never made a vow to God, and I could not go back on this vow. So I was determined that if he saved me, I was going to serve him. Well, he did his part, so I had to do mine. And so I started this new life. I started this new life, and it was difficult, you know, not having anything. I didn't have anything. It was just a total new beginning. But he was, he was letting me know that he was leading me. So I just kept following him. And I got me a Bible, and I got in a church, and I, I just started fellowshipping with other believers. And when I started reading the Bible— it was the most fascinating book I had ever read. I didn't know God was this great. I didn't know he could do, you know, part the Red Sea. And I didn't know he did things like that. I knew he was powerful, but I just knew what, you know, from my grandmother. When I began to read about him myself, and then I started seeing God do things for me. You know, within six months, I was off probation 
I had met all the requirements. I had paid all the fees. I mean, God was just working just so many miracles in my life. So I was determined. You know, I had people that were watching me because I had been to jail many times and people were just waiting for that aha moment so that they could say, you know, we knew this wasn't real. But um, I didn't care about that. The only thing I cared about was following the Lord and getting closer to Him. I really wanted to know this Savior who had just saved me because everybody else had given up on me. Everybody else had scratched my name off the list. Even some people in the church said, she's a hopeless case. I just needed to just walk with Him and let Him show me who he was. First of all, he showed me his goodness, and then he showed me how great and powerful he is. Mm. Jenna, you mentioned uh, in that encounter that you had with God that you just knew that you weren't going to go back. And when it comes to to drug addiction, when it comes to uh, sex, when it comes to these addictions that grip people, a lot of the times we find that it is really hard for people to not look back. And obviously we know that there is temptation and things happen, but for you, did it really just happen that the desire was gone, that the the desire even to, to do cocaine or to do crack, was that completely gone or was there a processing that had to happen? I believe what was working the most, because I didn't really know too much about the love of God. I was just getting to know Him. So I think what was working the most for me was the fear of going back. I knew that if I went back, I would die. So I had no desire to to ever go back. I was too afraid. And I had heard about, you know, some of my friends who, who, who had died out there in the streets, and they died horrible deaths. And I was afraid of that. So this fear gripped me, and that's what kept me in the, in the proper parameters, so to speak. I didn't step outside of those boundaries because I felt like that was dangerous. And I know what God had, how he had brought me out of that. I, I, I believe that Jesus loved me so much that he had, he had gone to great lengths. If I, if I could say such a thing, you know, I know about the cross and I know what he did on the cross. So I felt like that was personal for me. I couldn't go back on that. I couldn't. Janet, what happened with your with your children? I'm sure that was tough seasons for them to handle. What happened with your relationship with them after you came out and had this transformative moment with God? My children were taken away from me. They were removed from my custody when I was in my addiction. So my first goal was to get myself straightened out. I needed to, you know, find a place to live after I moved out of this lady's house. I needed employment. I needed all of that. So my first year um, being saved, and, 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 and I really just dug in very deep in the Word of God. I believe that the Word of God is what just kept me. Just the Word of God is what kept me. The first year that I was saved, I did absolutely nothing concerning the exterior things, so to speak. It was all, it was between me and the Lord. I was just working on me. And then after about a year and a half, uh, God called me to go back into the jail. He told me, he said, you promised me you would you know, tell others about me. And he said, "Um, you need to do this. So I started going into the jail. And after about two years of walking with the Lord, the subject came up concerning my children. Now, I don't mean I didn't think about them. I just knew I could not focus on other things first. I had to focus on my walk, just me and the Lord Jesus. And then after that, I started um, entertaining, you know, conversations about how, you know, my kids were, how I could get them back. I knew where they were. A family member had them. So I wasn't worried about them, but I started thinking about how I could get them back. 
And I was just told that I couldn't because my parental rights had been taken. And um, that was hard. That was really hard. But again, I had made a vow to God. So I wasn't going to go back on it, no matter what happened. That was probably the hardest thing that I had to, to deal with as a Christian. Because I thought, well, now that I'm saved, everything's supposed to be peaches and cream. And it wasn't. There were some things that I had done. I suffered the consequences of them. So I didn't get to raise my children. I can say today that I have a relationship with all three of my children, but I didn't get to raise them. They never returned to me. How did that relationship build over time? And if you could just give us a little bit of more insight of what God did in that that relationship with them. My oldest son, he really, he was the most um, forgiving. He really wanted to to reestablish a relationship with me because he had been with me the longest. My younger two, they hadn't been with me uh, but a very short time. So he was the one that came back first. And uh, I just kind of reached out to him and, you know, start telling him who I am today. And, And I did. I had to apologize to my children. I had to repent and ask their forgiveness. And I did that I did that publicly. I did that in the presence of my entire family. I don't know how well that went over because they were young, but I know my oldest son, he was the first to want to reestablish a relationship with me. My daughter, she was pretty kind about it. She just, you know, she let me know that she was not willing to change locations. She did let me know that. So she wanted to stay with my family member. My middle son, he was kind of back and forth. He was kind of, well, one minute he was one way, another minute. So I felt like there was maybe some influence going on there. But eventually they all came around, and um, we, we have a relationship today. So I give God praise for that. Hey, man, you mentioned you have grandkids and— yes. I have five grandchildren. As a matter of fact, my oldest son is coming to visit me tomorrow. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Jenna, you mentioned 30 years, and you're actually, from what you shared with me, is 30 years this year? Yes. 30 years of walking with the Lord. If you could put in a nutshell what God has done in your life and what life has been walking with God for these last 30 years, Uh, What could you say about these last years? Uh, He has made my life brand new. Everything about me. You know, when I was a little girl, they they used to sing this song, and they said, I looked at my hands, and my hands looked new, and I looked at my feet, and my feet did too. That's just metaphorically. But um, I thought it was for real. But in my life... He has transformed me into a total new person. He's just given me a brand new life, and I consider it a gift. It's a gift from God, and um, it is so precious because Jesus, he paid for it with his blood. And so I feel so—I owe this debt— I owe this tremendous debt that I could never pay. And all I can do is just love him and exalt his name and tell people about how wonderful he is, how great he is, how powerful he is, how mighty he is, so that they would know, first of all, that he's real, and second of all, is that he can do anything but fail. Janet, who is Jesus to you? Jesus is, he's first of all, he's my Savior, he's my Lord, he's my big brother, he's my friend, he's everything, he's everything to me because without him, without him, I wouldn't even want to be in the same room with myself without him. And we, by the grace of God, we've had an, we've had an opportunity 
to share these testimonies with uh, people in prison. So your testimony right now, um, in the near future, when people watch this, there's going to be people in prison actively who are going to be watching your testimony. Could you give them a word of encouragement as they're watching right now incarcerated? Yes, I would like them to know that just because you've messed up, it doesn't mean that your life is over. So many people say, well, you don't know what I've done. Well, you don't know all that I've done. But I do know the one who knows it all, and he is able to save. I don't care what your situation is. I don't care what your circumstances are. He is able to save. His blood is able to redeem. I think about the story in um, in the Bible. I think it's Jeremiah where he says that he had this vessel, and the vessel that he had made was marred but it was in his hand. And I think about that. I think of myself. I was marred, but I was in his hand. So instead of him throwing me away, he just put me back on the wheel and made me into another vessel. And that's what he can do for you. He is able to save and to deliver. Even the most vilest, the most wickedest. You you might think that you're incorrigible. Maybe someone's said that to you, but he is able to take your life and transform you into a thing of beauty, and he will get glory out of your life if you will simply trust him. Janet, could you pray for those who are watching right now and are ready to receive Jesus into their life? are ready to encounter him. Maybe they have a desire to encounter him in a fresh way, the way that you've encountered him. Could you just pray for them as they're watching right now? Yes. Father, I pray for the people who are watching this video. I pray, oh God, that they would have a divine encounter with you and that they would know that you are able that you are able to save them. I pray that they would cry out to you, even in their desperation, oh God, and that they would know that this is not their end. But God, you can take the scraps of their lives and transform it into a thing of beauty as you did me, oh God. You have given me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Oh God, you have done so much in my life, that you, but you're no respect of persons. God, you're able to do the same for everyone who's listening under the sound of my voice. And I pray, God, that they would just come to the place where they're able to cry out to you and trust you and just ask you to give them another chance. This I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And do you have any last words for people who are watching your testimony right now? Yes, I I want people to know about the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. You know, when the Lord saved me, I was nothing. I was absolutely nothing. I had nothing, and I had nowhere to turn but to Him. But the Lord took the scraps of my life, and He transformed it into something so beautiful. You know... I never dreamed that I would do the things that God has done uh, in my life. I, I became a teacher after being a prostitute on the street. I became a high school English teacher. God allowed me to go to college and graduate in four years to become a high school English teacher. And then after teaching for four years, I went back to school, got my master's degree, and and became a principal of a Christian school. And then after that, he blessed me to go back to school and get my doctorate. Now, we're talking about from a prostitute, a crack-addicted street prostitute, to 
being Dr. Janet Taylor Gwynn today. But none of that could have happened without the blood of Jesus. So I want you to know that there are miracles that are just waiting to, to happen in your life. But it all starts with Jesus. It all starts with Jesus. And when you put your life in his hand, you will be so amazed at what he creates, what he does, what he brings out of the mess and out of the, the rottenness. You'll be so amazed at how he transforms all of that into a masterpiece for his namesake and for his glory. I, this is what I want people to know.